What is true greatness? Is it wealth or fame or power? Let's allow Jesus to teach us about true greatness. We'll look at Mark 10, 35 to 45 and see the difference between this world's ideas of greatness and God's. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came over and spoke to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do us a favor. What's your request? he asked. They replied, when you sit on your glorious throne, we want to sit in places of honor next to you, one on your right and the other on your left. But Jesus said to them, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I am about to drink? Are you able to be baptized with the baptism of suffering I must be baptized with? Oh yes, they replied, we're able. Then Jesus told them, you will indeed drink from my bitter cup and be baptized with my baptism of suffering. But I have no right to say who will sit on my right or my left. God has prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. When the ten other disciples heard what James and John had asked, they were indignant. So Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of this world lord it over their people, and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first among you must be the slave of everyone else. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others, and to give his life as a ransom for many. The two sons of Zebedee reveal themselves in an embarrassing way, blatantly asking Jesus to give them the two highest positions in his kingdom, to his left and right like two people talking past each other as if they were carrying on two separate conversations. Jesus had just finished giving the third major prophecy of his passion, describing being delivered into the hands of political and religious leaders, condemned to death, spat on, scourged, killed, and rising after three days. This went completely over the heads of the disciples, who expected Jesus to free Israel from Roman occupation and be king in Jerusalem. Some people teach that if you think you're qualified for high position, then you definitely are not. That's not how Jesus works. He will include James and John in leadership, but teach them what that means. Do you want to be a church leader? Do you know what that really means? Some people may want to be a church leader, but cannot handle pressure. It's a difficult calling. James and John did not know what they were asking of Jesus. They naively wanted chief positions in God's kingdom. Few people realize what leadership in the church really means. Ask a pastor sometime. It means loneliness, criticism, conflict, family problems, stress, depression, burnout, sexual temptation, financial struggles, and a lack of personal time. A person has to be either crazy or called by God to be a pastor. If a person really knows what it means, they don't choose it. It takes a lot of faith to answer God's call. Every pastor drinks Jesus' cup to some extent, and is baptized to some degree with his baptism. We don't share in the communion cup or the baptism of Jesus to the same degree that Jesus did. Our sacrifices do not save all of humanity. Yet to some degree church leaders partake of suffering as he did. The cup of wine also pictures God's wrath. Jesus took our punishment for sin on himself. We also don't suffer the baptism of Jesus in the same manner as he did. 
In this context, baptism is metaphorical and not literal. It pictures being overwhelmed by the flood of events, by tribulation and persecution. Jesus was overwhelmed. Pastors are, to a lesser degree, overwhelmed all the time. Those who seek power may only be interested in lording it over others, and not a life of sacrifice. The brothers' quick reply that they were able reveals their naivety. Jesus tells James and John that he submits to the Father's will in setting up authorities. Do we? Do we run church as tradition or self-will dictates? Or are we willing to change when we see God's clear will that we do things a different way? If we see selfish ambition in the original twelve disciples, do we also see it in the church today? If Jesus is willing to make apostles out of such a political group, ought we be surprised to find similar pushing and shoving in the church today? As the disciples imitated the petty, selfish rulers of this world, so too do we in the church at times. We must all remember, apostle and ordinary church member alike, that true leadership is found in loving service to others, not in job titles and positions of power. Often termed the great reversal is Jesus' teaching here and in many other places. As missionaries reverse our ideas of greatness by sacrificing for foreigners and complete strangers, Jesus also reversed the world's idea of greatness by serving rather than being served. Jesus came down to us from the most fabulous heavenly wealth in the entire universe. As God with us, he was born near the stench of dung in a stable, lived the life of an itinerant preacher without fixed abode, and died the death of a criminal on a cross to take away our sins. Jesus' example is a pattern after which every disciple then and now should model their lives. Our sacrifice is not as great. We cannot save humanity, but we can serve. We can lay down our lives in loving service. Title is not greatness. Service is. We all have an opportunity for true greatness. It begins as close as our nearest neighbor. It begins with loving service.